Okay, go and see. All right, well, I'm really excited to be here because opportunities like this always give me an opportunity to sit back and kind of evaluate where I am because I'm going to sit and talk about a lot of stuff and I need to kind of do a self-check and say, Does what I'm talking about, am I applying this in my life? Um, this, when Rich, Rich Christensen is actually a very good friend of mine. I spent a lot of time with him doing uh, a lot hiking and doing other stuff too. He says, we want to provide the opportunity for these students to meet with successful business people, entrepreneurs. So I had to sit back and really look at myself and say, successful, what does that mean? Am I successful? And how do we define successful most of the time? Right. Money. Wealth, right? What else, power? There's a lot to it. So when we sit back and look at that, and I say, am I successful based on that de definition? Wealth and power. And you know what? I'm going to tell you I am, but not in the way you're going to think about it. Wealth to me is not money. Wealth to me is the opportunities. I have a wealth of opportunities. I get to choose what I do every day. And, and power. I have a power every day to wake up and decide how I'm going to act. I can set my own destiny. I can do things I want to. If I don't like something, I can do something about it. How much is that worth? I know a lot of guys that make a ton of money that are not happy. So they wake up and do a lot of things. So I think when we look at success, and I think that's one thing that if I could partake for you guys, uh, is look at success. Success is a personal thing and it's personal to everybody. Your idea of success is gonna be different than mine. But mine, I get to choose every day. I wake up every day, I can choose my own destiny. If, I don't, if, if there's something going on, do something about it. So, so that's good. A um, little bit about me, just, just context more than anything, just so you kind of get to connect and see that bottom line is I'm no different than you guys. I was here 20 years ago, 25 years ago, going to the University of Utah, uh, trying to figure out where I was. So... I'll tell you a little bit more about my story and how I ended up there first, but a brief introduction. We already do introduced Millie, who is my best friend. We uh, actually met fighting forest fires. We both were on wildland, wildland fire crews. So if you can find a girl that can hike and swing an axe and a shovel and get dirty and grab her, I'll give you that advice. I, we brought up my kids, the three kids, little attitude, and mainly this one, well that one. Little attitude, sport, crazy. Uh, we love the outdoors. We spend a lot of time outside. Love to spend time together, doing a lot of different activities. So we can kind of see through some of this. Millie's crazy about horses, and uh, spends a lot of time with her horses. So we're going to talk a little bit about my story. As they said, I grew up in Roosevelt, Utah. How many of you guys know where that's at? It's a little hole in the wall out in eastern northeastern Utah. Very oil driven, very uh, a lot of agricultural stuff out there. So as you're growing up, that's what you do. You work in the oil field or you work on a farm. There's a little bit of uh, government work with forest services and stuff. So when I was growing up, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up from the time I was very small. I was going to be a professional baseball player. That was my goal. And I, and I worked all the way through even through high school and even into college, I played uh, baseball at, on a baseball scholarship. And all of a sudden it hit me like a rock, a ton of rocks. Hey dude, you're not gonna make this into a profession. You're not good enough. You're not big enough. You're not fast enough. So it was a come to Jesus moment that I had to make a decision on what I was gonna do. Well, my family had been in education all their life. So education was very important to me. And I'd taken it very serious. <clears throat> Kind of. I mean, homework was optional for me. I didn't do a lot, but I could take tests, and that was my saving grace, because I had a good memory. I could read something or hear something once and, and remember it. So I could sleep through class, pay attention a little bit, and pass. But as we progressed, that didn't work out very well. As we got into college and actually started having to do case studies and, and do papers and stuff, that memory didn't work as well for me. So I had to start, I had to start applying myself and really focusing on what I, what I needed to learn. And I fell in love with, with business. And it, it wasn't business 
specific side of business, just business, making things happy, happen, solving problems, figuring out issues, and, and finding solutions. So that's what I fell in love with. So what did I do? I chose to go into accounting, probably the least, <laughs> least uh, thinking, creative area of business. But I'll tell you right now that accounting is for me the, the basis of my success and why I am where I am. Because if you can look at a financial statement or look at a uh, costing of something and truly understand it, you can make good decisions. And uh, if you don't understand it and you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants, I know a lot of guys and a lot of guys I work with is you have a good product and you market it, things are great. Well, there's some truth to that, but there's a lot more to it than, than that. So, so accounting for me is a, a kind of a default. And I went into it. I actually worked for a major, a big, it was Big Six at the time, accounting firm for five years. I enjoyed it. Did a lot of tax, my emphasis was corporate tax. Did a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Did a lot of work for Sinclair. A lot of the big uh, informational technology companies at the time. Uh, it was interesting, but I didn't love it. It wasn't something that I'd wake up every morning and go like, yes, what's, what's gonna be my challenge today? I mean, you'd see a lot of problems, you'd see a lot of issues, but they weren't my problems or my issues. I was just there to report and say, hey, they have an issue or they have an opportunity. So I had an opportunity to go to work for a company, um, leave the accounting firm, which I was doing some work for, and so I, I was actually on a project with um, an account with Temkin International, so I called up the owner and said, hey, I'm leaving, we're gonna have somebody else uh, work on your account. He said, where are you going? And I told him, he said, let me make you an offer. So he did. And I said, nah, I'm leaving. So I still was leaving, and he came back with another offer. So this, and, and the bad thing is, as an auditor, you see all the dirty laundry of companies. I mean, you can get in there and you can see the good and the bad. So I knew there were some challenges with Tempkin as I was going, so I could see that. And uh, so the second offer made sense. The guy that owns the company founded it in his garage. He uh, was very entrepreneurial. He's an uh, Israeli a uh, special service soldier that came over and didn't know what to do. He wanted to get out all the conflict that was in the Middle East. So he left and moved to LA. Not that there's not a lot of cl conflict in LA. Again, this is mid 80s, so we were having a lot of issues there too. So actually he had, he had brought the company up from, from LA to Utah. And at the time we were about 3 million in sales, but they were having a lot of growing pains. And as you start a company, cash flow, um, inventory control, machinery capacity. There's a lot of growing pains going on through this, this time. But I looked at it and I said, you know what? I think there's some good I can do there and I can help. That was 21 years ago. This year we'll be over 100 million in sales. We have 700 employees in four locations. Miami, Pace and Utah is our corporate headquarters. You guys drive by it all the time, you don't know what it is. It's in Pace and it's a big orange and white building right on the side of the freeway. So if you ever drive to Salt Lake, that's, that's it. Uh, so Miami, Pace and Toronto, Canada, and Bogota, Colombia, and we're in the process of opening Quito, Ecuador, Ecuador right now. So just a little bit, you can see kind of some of the stuff we do. We do plastic packaging, fle flexible films. And in some circles, packaging and stuff's taboo because of the garbage and stuff, and I'll explain a little bit later why we have to look at it a little closer. So you'll see a lot of these products. We actually just make the bags, we send it to the customers all over the world, and they put their product inside and then design it. So, so that's a little bit about Tempkin. The, they asked me to kind of bring up a couple of things or ideas um, that I wish I would have known earlier. I actually think this is the wrong presentation I loaded. This, this is something that we see. Uh, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. What does that mean to you guys? What is, anybody have any ideas? Noah, what does that mean? In my opinion? Yep. I think you mean that you've got a plan of where you want to go unless you're taking daily action to get there and accomplish that goal. You're going to get run past by all these opportunities and all these other people that are hungry anymore. That's right. That's right. You have to keep moving, have to keep getting better. 
At Tempkin, we have a saying that we have to be better than the best, even if the best is us. Every day, we have to get better. There's some things we're the best at, but we have to get better every day, because if not, somebody's going to catch up to us or pass us. There's other things we're not as good at, and we need to improve. We have to continually grow and continue to progress as we, as we move through uh, business. Now, does that create pressure? Manufacturing, I mean, the art, manufacturing's not for the faint of heart. Yesterday is gone. Nothing I can do about it. It's today and it's tomorrow. We have to plan and move forward. So a lot of times we get big orders. We have a great shipping day. We high five everybody, party until 8.02 and then it's gone. And it's what, what are we doing today? That's hard. That's, it's just that constant pressure, that constant grind. It takes a special person to be able to, to handle that and just like let it go and just really grow. So when, when we look at business and stuff, we have, to, we have to continually evolve and progress. So one thing I want to talk about is, is why customers buy from a company. What, what sets them apart? Why would you buy from company A versus company B? What's some ideas? Quality. Price. Price. Trust. Trust. Okay. Loyalty. Loyalty. Right. Where do how do these rank? Price. Where does price rank? That's pretty high up there. It depends. Right. It depends on what you're buying. If it's a commodity product that anybody can make and there's not a lot of difference, price is probably the driving factor. If it's a premium product, let's say a handbag, let's say Gucci or Louis Vuitton handbag, is price as big a object? Obviously it's not because I mean they're way overpriced for what you're getting, Millie. Uh, <laughs> so you have, to, you have to differentiate those. So when we look at ways to grow our company and ways to do things, we have to look at our competitive advantages of over other companies. Every business we do is their competition even if it's not a direct competition to exactly what they're doing, there's substitutes, there's alternatives, there's doing without, there's competition in everything we do. So competitive advantage is a huge thing for us. What, what drives people to make change in, in their buying patterns? Let's say you're buying from company A and we want to go to company B. Everything is going okay with company A, Price is good, delivery's on time. Is there a lot of motivation to switch to company B? No. There's not, is there? There has to be a reason. There has to be a, a controlling force to push the, the transaction or the movement. And a lot of times that's frustration, right? You, you, get, you get in a situation maybe that you just had a price increase. Uh, maybe you had a lack of supply. Maybe your last order was the quality wasn't good. And that creates some frustration, right? in your buying process. If you guys ever uh, had a car and you're driving down the street and it breaks down, all of a sudden you're in the market for a new car, aren't you? You're a lot, lot more apt to buy a new car then than you were if your car, everything was running perfectly. So frustration is a driving force. But what I want to talk about is frustration in the, in the marketplace creates opportunity for business. And that's how we can grow and progress and uh, keep moving is by Identifying the frustrations, what's causing the frustrations, and, and capitalizing or exploiting those, those constraints that are causing the frustration. So let's talk about constraints. And that's the, the thing on, on businesses, a lot of businesses, there's constraints. There's constraints on a company, and there's constraints on customers and, and how to get stuff. So let's talk about some constraints on a company. I own a company. I want to sell a product. I have all the business that I want, but I have some constraints that I can't get the product to them. What's some of those constraints? What do you think some of them could be? Shipping. Shipping. Shipping costs. I mean, just distribution channels, stuff like that, shipping. International. Right. There's a big problem. Taxes. 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 On the other end, you know what it's better. Right. Regulations. Regulations. Production capacity is a big one. Labor. Packaging. Packaging. That is, and we'll talk about that. That is, because there's some components of that. What else? Warehousing. Warehousing, geographic location, energy costs. There's a lot of constraints placed on companies, 
right, that, that provide product. What are some constraints placed on customers that, that want to buy? Salary. Salary, okay, customers, they want to buy. They want, price is too high. They have a product they want to buy, but the price is too high, right? What else? Time, I need it quick, but you can't deliver it fast enough to me. Access, right? Um, anything else? Supply, I mean, just, just getting it in. So those are some good, good examples of constraints. So when we're, when we're identifying constraints and how we're gonna work on stuff, uh, we, we really, uh, and one thing I was gonna bring up too, back to the packaging idea, is, is small or minimum order quantities. A lot of small, small companies want something custom, want something um, customized to themselves, but the minimum order quantity might be out of reach. You know what, I need to buy 10,000 widgets, whatever it is, but I only need two. And that's, that's a constraint of a growing business all the time. And you have to balance the decision, do I buy 10 or pay for 10 to get two, or, or what do I do? So there's a lot of constraints based on that. So a good business, what they do, first of all, we have to look at the company side, side of the constraints. If we're already sold out, we don't have any machine capacity, are we going to go drop prices to sell more units? That doesn't make sense, does it? I can't already produce what I'm selling. So what am I going to do if I'm maximum machine capacity? I'm saying raise price. If I'm not losing 10, 15% of my orders based on price, my price is too low. I need to jack the price up. Uh, something else with, with distribution. If I can't deliver a product because... Uh, I'm shipping it international and I can't get it to somebody, what's my options? How can I handle, a, uh, how can I handle or fix that problem? Maybe a warehouse, maybe longer lead time, I have to order earlier so it gets here quicker. So we're identifying some of these, these constraints on a company and we're gonna manage our company based on different constraints. Now I'm gonna explain how some of this works and how we use it at Tempkin uh, a little bit and how we've turned those constraints into opportunities for us, but I'll go through these for a second. Uh, so from company constraints, we really have to gear our, our company set up. If, if we're at capacity and everything else, there's not a lot, we're not gonna go chase new business. We're gonna really work on efficiency and getting more stuff out the door. So we're gonna focus that. Customer constraints, we talked about some of those. Price, what can we do as a supplier to a customer what can we do to improve efficiency? I mean, or price, improve efficiency, right? To lower price. That drives, that solves their need. That's one thing, I really think this is the old version, yeah, it is. Because I had a quote from Steve Jobs that says, if you ask your customer what they want, you're gonna be too late because by the time you get it to product, they're gonna want something different. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? People's needs and wants and are continually evolving and continually moving, so you have to adjust. You have to know what the customer wants before they do. You present to them what they want. A lot of times, they don't know what's available. 15 years ago, would you guys have known you wanted the latest iPhone with all the technology? If you could do Google Maps or anything in your hand or, or we wouldn't have known we wanted that because we didn't know it was available. So the innovation and stuff, they were forthright and forward thinking enough to know what, you know what, the technology is there, people will want it. So with customers, we need to be able to understand them, understand their needs, understand their pains, and turn that into a business. Does that make sense to you guys? Sounds, sounds easy. It's, it's, not that easy most of the time because you have to really get to know and get customers and have a good enough relationship with them that they'll spill their guts. They'll tell you where things hurt. You know what, your price is 20% too high. They tell us all the time. Well, is it? Is it all price? I mean, yeah, you can get it from somebody 20% cheaper than us, but they don't deliver half the time. Lead times are six months. We, we run into that in Asia a lot. I had a slide of a big uh, ocean container on fire and it said importing, 
Are you still waiting for your ship to come in? And that we have that hanging in our, in our front lobby because the comp uh, imports is a big competition for us. And there's a lot of logistical nightmares when you start importing and putting stuff on a boat. A few years ago, we had dock strikes in LA. You guys probably don't even remember that, but there was a lot, there was over 200 sea containers in the Long Beach port that the, the longshoremen would not unload. So normal lead times went from eight weeks to 24 weeks. And right before Christmas, people were planning on, on this product to resell, and it was sitting on a boat in Long Beach, and they couldn't get it unloaded. Out of our control. We can't do anything about it. But for us, that was an opportunity to jump in and turn things around quickly. So, so let me give you a few examples on Temke and how we've turned some of the constraints into, into opportunities. I'm going to start with, well, I'm, I'm going to start with our warehouse, with inventory. So this is Tempkin. You guys drive by it all the time. You've seen it. Inventory. What's the accounting philosophy on and banking, anything, business? What's the philosophy on inventory? Less is more, right? Just in time. Keep it bare minimum. Keep just what you need and move it. We're totally the opposite. And this is where we go against the grain. The biggest, the biggest advantage we have over Asia or anywhere is time. If Asia can do it cheaper, they do a good job, quality for the most part, there's good companies, bad companies, but they do a good job. We can't beat them up, but it's time. That's our advantage. Geographic location. They have to put stuff either in the air or on a boat. In the air is expensive. On a boat is time consuming. It takes time. So if you're packaging a product, let's say we're doing kale chips, which my wife's a holistic nutritionist, so this is my treats. If you guys ever want to watch a good video, watch the Cholo's First Try Kale Chips on YouTube. That'll make you laugh. It's good. Uh, so, kale chips. So, all of a sudden, Walmart, let's, let's, cost, let's go Costco because I like them better. Uh, Costco um, wants to run a special on kale chips. So, I have the product, but I don't have the packaging. So last week it was a different pr uh, package for Walmart. They wanted orange. Costco wants blue. So how much are they willing to pay to get stuff in two weeks versus 12 weeks? More, right? There's a premium. There's a value added, a service added by supplying the product quicker. So we do this all the time. Our niche is... We, we preach 21 days. 21 days from the orders placed to the products delivered. You don't realize how much goes into making a plastic bag. Looks pretty simple. You put some ink on it. You, this is actually like 15 to 16 processes to make this one bag. We have to slit the material to the right size. We have to, first of all, the graphic design, the plates. We have to make the medium to actually put the ink on. We have to get the right material. We have to enter the orders. We have to uh, match colors. We have to uh, print and we have to laminate, take two different kinds of plastic and glue them together. Then we have to slit again and there's just then finally make a pouch, put a zipper in, you have a finished product and send it to the customer. 21 days. We don't have time to wait for material in that circumstances. So what we do is we have it on the floor we can go pull it. It might not be perfect. It might not be the right size, but we can charge a premium for that. So we're not looking when we do our year-end analysis and stuff. We don't look at inventory turns, which is kind of contradictory to most, most accountants and everything else. We're looking return on investment on our inventory. We treat it like a machine or another asset. We're not looking at how fast we're turning it. If we can make money by having it on the floor and we win some and we lose some, as long as we win more than we lose, we're ahead. So inventory management is one of our big, big advantages. Uh, also, we talked about innovation and stuff as we're trying to be more efficient. This is more inventory, you see. I mean, we have about 9 million pounds of plastic on the floor. It's a lot of plastic. There's very few people in the world that have more plastic than us. And the bankers come in and have heart attack, and they see it until they understand and they look. I mean, we haven't had a down year 
since 1980 when we were incorporated. Even through 2008 and everything with the growth, 2008 we had the big crash. And what was the propensity for all businesses? To tighten their belts, to buckle down, to cut the fat, to everything. We're going to cut travel, we're going to cut marketing expenses, we're going to cut capital expenditures. We did the opposite. We said, you know what? There's opportunity. There's going to be frustration. Customers are looking for lower prices. There's an, there's an opportunity out there. Customers are looking to quicker turnaround. I want to order less. I want to do smaller orders. Hey, that plays into our hands. How can we adjust our business to meet their needs? One way we did it was add some new equipment. This is a, a printing press that is totally unique to us. You see each one of these blue cylinders is actually a deck that prints a certain color. So when we're looking at this, and after if you have a minute, there, if you look at some of these prints, these are actually made up of millions of little tiny dots. Just like a computer monitor, the, the pixels and everything, it's the same, same theory, just done with, with big rubber plates. And that's what this is, like a big rubber stamp. So to, the preciseness to get these little dots to line up so the image actually looks clear is an art. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of setup time. For example, this press takes about, well, the old presses prior to this took about an hour per color. This is 13 colors. So you're 13 hours to go from job A to job B. There's a lot of time. This machine's worth about 4.5 million. We value the machine time. We need to be netting $500 an hour. So if you're at 13 hours times five, what's that, $1,800? $6,500, that's better. Yeah, so that's a lot. You have to be churn churning that through to get $6,500 just to add it to the cost before we even turn the machine on, before we put any, pro or any material or anything in. So what we did is went and reinvented the wheel. This machine takes about 10 minutes per color to set up. Just because of the way it's designed and the way we adopted things and everything else. Does that make a difference? Now those big long runs, I don't have to amortize. If I'm doing 10,000 bags, I can amortize the $1,500 versus the $6,800 over that 10,000 bags. Big price savings, big difference. So just by innovation and kind of looking at machines, collaborating with our suppliers, Expressing our constraints and what we needed to our suppliers allowed us a competitive advantage in this, this case. A few more pictures of that and we'll show you a little bit of inventory and stuff. That's what a lot of stuff we go out the door is not actually in pre-made bags. We send it in roll stock so customers actually can convert it and make it into products. Okay, second item. We talked about produce, green beans. Who eats green beans? We all eat a few, don't we, if we have to? I have to eat a lot again. So, green beans, the, the normal market, uh, we grow a lot of green beans in Utah in our garden, but the harvest period's, what, mid-summer? We kind of pick them in June, July. So most of our produce comes from the Salinas, California area. Uh, uh, they call it the, uh, the Imperial Valley and stuff over there. They grow a lot in that area. Also down around Yuma, Arizona. Um, the, the salad belts, what they call it. So, but we're limited by weather on what we can produce and when fresh green beans are available. Well, there's climates that allow them to grow year-round in optimal climate all the time. Guatemala is one of those. This is actually a product of Guatemala, these green beans. This is, I bought this at Walmart, and we actually supply this bag. So we actually make it in Payson, ship it to Guatemala. Prior to us packaging this, uh, they'd send it in bulk. Big containers, big Gaylords full, or bulk bins of, full of, of green beans. Well, the shelf life on that from, from harvest to where you had to throw it away was about 14 days. That's pretty short, right? And I have to ship it from Guatemala to get it to my supermarket to display it and take it home and eat it. So a lot of times they were having to fly or truck this stuff directly from, from Guatemala right through Mexico fast as they could to get it to the supermarkets. And they were having 
20 to 30 percent shrink away at the end because of bad product. So there was some big constraints. It didn't make sense. A lot of the, the cost was too high to air freight stuff. So the, the Guatemala green bean market, they could grow a ton, but the constraint was delivery and the distribution channels. They just couldn't get it to market fast enough. There's not enough people in Guatemala to eat what they could grow. But the US, Europe, and Asia, there's a ton. And so the constraint was time. So we identified that and we said, man, if we could figure out how to extend the shelf life of those green beans, we could open up a huge market for them. So what we did is work, worked with a food scientist in, back in New Hampshire and came up with some technology where we take lasers and actually put little tiny microscopic holes into this package. And we control, it's, it's not the same for every product. It's not, if it's eight ounces of green beans, it's different than if it's 12 ounces of green beans. It varies, that, it's that specific. If the ends are snipped, it's different than if they're not snipped. So it's very specific. With that technology, we went from, this is a control, this is after 28 days in the old, the old method, and this is in the package after 28 days. So we went from 14 to 28 just by putting it in a bag. Now there was a little cost to the bag, but is that worth it? Is that it outweighed the distribution limitations? So a couple weeks ago, uh, I actually was, uh, met with the largest green bean grower in Guatemala. I mean, this guy's a multi-gazillionaire. He, he controls everything. Um, but he sat down with us and he was in almost in tears. He said, first of all, I want to just tell you thank you from the people of Guatemala. They were able to take from, five, or from 50 growers to over 5,000 growers. So they created that many, uh, I mean, just businesses and, not, and the, you expand that out to the people actually working on the farms, they created that many businesses and took them from living in poverty, selling tortillas on a street corner, to actually a viable product selling green beans to us in the U.S. That's pretty cool. Who thinks? Packaging? Yeah, we don't think about it. We didn't think about it. We didn't think of that. We just were trying to sell more bags. But now we're, we're supplying not only to the US, they're shipping to Europe, they're shipping to Asia, uh, which now supplies in, uh, income and revenue back into Guatemala that allows them to grow and progress and build infrastructure and do a lot of other things. So pretty cool when we go down there and actually see all these little five foot two Mayan women just working 100 miles an hour trimming green beans and everything else. I mean, it's, it's pretty neat. So when I first started, was I passionate about plastic? No, you know, that wasn't my passion. But I was passionate about solving problems and identifying uh, areas that can grow and s solving problems. And, and that's, that's what's fun about business, is it allows you to, to work through things and, and pull it together and, and see a result at the end. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, it, I'm gonna stop there. We, we can kind of look at it, but I'll show you a couple more pictures. <laughs> Oh, that's it on this one. I have some more on some other studies we did on green beans and stuff too. So, uh, if you guys have any questions, open it up to questions. Go ahead. How do you feel and what are you doing about offsetting all the plastic that you're producing? Do you encourage your buyers to recycle it? Are you putting something in the package or are you just sending it all out? Very good question. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, pressure on landfill, uh, filling up landfills. Actually, if, if green beans aren't a good example, but, but let's say kale chips. The old, old way to sell, sell kale chips was what? A cardboard box with a liner inside, right? That was the way. Actually, the big push and why you see most of the supermarkets moving to this type of packaging is because the carbon footprint is actually less on a flexible film because we empty the product, we wad this up. It takes a lot less space and landfill than it does the box and everything else. Paper is a, is, is a lot of people go back to paper and say, okay, paper's a better alternative. If you go to a landfill, paper doesn't even biodegrade in a landfill because it has to be lined so it doesn't leach, it doesn't do anything. So they're digging up landf or, uh, landfills from 50 years ago. The new newspapers are still eligible, or legible because they just, things do not break down in landfills. 
So our big thing, and we put a big push on it, is reduce, reuse, or recycle. I mean, those are the three things we push. So reduce, taking a big package, a lot of bulk and a lot of garbage down to something as minimal as we can. Re reuse, if, if there's something you can, like rigid containers and stuff, you can reuse it for repurpose it, either recycle it, grind it up for another product, that's a great viable alternative, or recycle it back into a, a way like a water bottle. You recycle a lot of water bottles, we can regrind those back up and make water bottles again. So there is a lot of pressure on packaging, and, and we work with the Plastic Coalition. There's a lot of bag bans. You know those cheap uh, Walmart carry-out bags, the little cheap thin ones that just blow away in the wind. That's what a lot of the bag bans are, are targeted at because just people are negligent in the way they take care of them. Plastic is, I mean, the carbon footprint to actually from from the, the whole product life cycle is a lot less, and there's been tons of studies on this, in a soft, flexible package than uh, bulk, even bulk green beans, for example, selling the bulk. Because of the 20% shrink, you're throwing all that product away. That required more freight, that required more fertilizer, that required a lot of other stuff. Is it the golden ticket and answer? No, and we're continuing to work and improve it right now. We're working on biodegradable films. But biodegradable films, then you have to use uh, polylactic acid, which is, which is a corn uh, byproduct. But there's a, it's all GMO controlled corn, and that's a bad word to these two over here. Uh, GMO, and so nobody wants to, like Whole Foods will not touch it because it's, so. So I understand the question, there is a lot of native context to plastic, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, if we really research it, it's either better or carbon footprint neutral, so. Good question. Go ahead. No, I mean you don't depreciate it because that's a, a, a gap rule. You don't have to depreciate it, but you're, we're looking at the rate of return. And and there's value as it sits, and we, I mean, and there's a cost to holding inventory, storage, everything else. So you have to account for that. You either expense it or under two, section 263A, which is an accounting code, you have to actually increase your value for tax purposes for inventory and overhead and all this. So there is a cost. And so you can't just write it off. But, but yeah, we don't depreciate it. So you took this, this whole concept of the green beans having a short shelf life, a constraint for mm -hmm. the green bean growers, and turned it into an opportunity. What advice do you have for other people that want to start a business that have the same problem where they have some type of constraint can you turn all constraints into opportunities? Uh, not all because there's some come some constraints that are just out of our control i mean if it's uh let's say there's a constraint or a barrier to entry that soft drinks are a great example i mean there's huge constraints to entering the soft drink just because the big boys control all the distribution channels that one's tough unless you can identify a way to to break in and, and turn a constraint. I mean, Red Bull did it, right? Red Bull went up against the big boys. They weren't owned by, by one of the big beverage companies, but they found their niche. They broke in with the, the distribution channels and they identified the constraints. Now those constraints keep everybody else or a lot of the other, the Monster, which is owned by Pepsi or Coke, or one of them that, that kind of compete with them. Um, goes against them, but they, they found their niche and now that's keeping a lot of other guys out. So sometimes barrier to entry is a good thing depending on which side of the, the constraint you're on, right? Patents is another one. Sometimes there's just patent technology that it's a constraint that you can't get around for a while unless you innovate around the product. So patents, so there's not always an answer, but if you identify that and then look for solutions, and if, you, if there is solutions, then that's a good opportunity. Go ahead. You spent all this money researching and developing this new green How do you prevent uh, your competitors to just copy your, your idea? And... That's a good question. There's some patents on this that, that protect some of it, but there's ways around those. So it's not a, you do it, you're, you're faster to market, you're ahead of the curve, you're running, but people are going to jump on and can do this. You just need to be better, faster, and keep it innovating, keep moving. Like we said, if you sit still, if that was our only idea, 
we would get overran because yeah, somebody can take this bag it and put it under a microscope and measure the holes and do everything. A laser is about five hundred thousand dollars. So that, that's a pretty big barrier to entry for some small guy that wants to do this. This market probably is seventy million dollars just the produce packaging. If you go to Costco, probably eighty percent of Costco has it's called control atmosphere packaging with the laser technology. There's other people doing it now, but we're way ahead of the curve, and we've done a good job. We build equipment to be more efficient, um, and, and a lot of that. I mean, a lot of times, your competitive advantage is just speed to market, fast as you can get there. That's one thing good about Tempke International. Our board of directors is the owner and me. We sit, and he's there once a week. I walk by, hey, we need to buy a $5 million printing press, and he says, okay. That's our board meeting. I mean, that's usually what, it's a little simple. It's when we know we need it, but that's what it takes. I mean, it's just that turn quick, being nimble and turning things around is a competitive advantage also. So how much emphasis do you place on innovation and coming up with a new product, new, I mean, huge focus on it? Huge, huge, a lot of pushing the envelope all the time. This product, for example, uh, Kodak, you guys are all familiar with Kodak with the cameras. Did you guys actually know they don't do cameras anymore? They divested of all that. So they actually supply the medium that the, the print plates that transfer the ink from the press to the product. We're their beta site, we're testing everything, we're pushing the envelope on everything we do. So we spend a lot of time and in, in energy innovating on, on higher print. For example, this, this job, if we look under a microscope and we look, the print definition in one inch, there will be 175 lines of dots in one inch, which is pretty good, pretty amazing uh, to get the definition. Most printers are doing 120 to 130. That's just their technology and that's where we're at. So that's 175. This is actually a trial run that we ran with beta. This is 240 lines per inch. What does that mean? Depends. I mean, it could be cool if you got a high-end graphic. If you're doing something like this, it means absolutely nothing. So innovating and finding markets that it makes sense to have this high-end graphic. Somebody that wants to display and set themselves apart. I mean, if you walk down a granola aisle and you see this versus just a bag with a sticker on it. Which one are you going to buy? Same price. I mean, you're going to look at it. I mean, this is going to catch your eye, and you're going to. So you have to go out and sell it to your customers too. And hey, I can differentiate you on the supermarket shelves. So we spent a lot of time and effort in business development. I just got back from Germany Saturday over there, looking at new machinery, uh, new innovations, new technology, anything we could find, and developing that. So. So if you were to put a percentage of your time going towards looking at simply new innovations and ways to push forward your company and keep it in the, you know, in the clear mm -hmm. and right over, what would you say? Your my, my time? Yeah. My time is probably 60%. We have other people that are 100%. That that's their job, business development. They're out there looking for new ideas, new materials, new machines, new something different, identifying problems. Hey, we're having an issue with... A good example, dog treats. You notice this is plastered with made in the USA. Dog treats, whatever. A few years ago, we had a lot of problems with uh, dog treats coming from China had melamine as a filler, which is a plastic, and they killed a bunch of dogs. So a lot of the big chains mandated that the product had to be made in the USA. Well, they could still buy packaging in Asia and bring it over at a cheaper price, but packaging actually, the cost of packaging is calculated to, you have to be able to say made in the USA has to be 93% made in the USA on this product. So there's some things they had to buy outside, some ad additives, fillers, stuff like that, they had to add. So we saw an opportunity in the dog treat market, hey, people need stuff and they need it quick. And we capitalized that and really targeted at that. So. Okay, one more question. Any more? Go ahead. Do, you, do, your, do your customers do all their graphics? We have a full in-house design team. That's another value added. That's another constraint that we identified that we 
provided for the customer. Because a lot of times these small guys that, that are just starting a granola company or something else don't have the capacity or resources to go to one of the huge design firms. Some, everybody has a cousin that's a graphic designer, so they come up with concepts and send it to us, but then we have to manipulate that into something that we can actually use to, to print. So, Well, thank you guys very much. I know this is kind of vague and it doesn't, but just the, the concept of identifying constraints and turning those into opportunities can really help help grow your business. And if you guys ever need anything, I'll leave my information and you can feel free to contact me anytime for anything. So, so here's our Thunderbird for, our, awesome. for uh, being our speaker. We sure appreciate it. Great. You. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time.